Great, really lovely to see so many of you here today. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to go straight over and hand over to Tom to uh, talk about his section within the Placemaking Handbook and also to frame um, our discussion today. Tom, thank you. Thank you, Cara. And welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for this discussion. Um, I want to first acknowledge that I'm speaking to you today from my home that is located on land forcibly and violently taken through colonialist practices from the Dakota and Ojibwe people, descendants of whom I am honored to be neighbors with today in what is now called Minneapolis. And thanks for the amazing work, Cara, for putting this uh, massive book together. Uh, and to all the authors, um, especially the seven authors in the section I assembled, and including those, of course, who have joined us today. And thanks to Roberto Bedoya, a longtime friend whose work and writing has provoked much important discussion and changes in how we think about relationships we have with places and with each other. What I tried to do with the section I edited was to contribute some things often missing from the discussion. That placemaking, and, and I'm not fond of the term for numerous reasons, uh, and if you read the book, see chapter 31, called Seven Generations, A Role for Artists in Zuni Place Knowing. Anyway, that placemaking as often practiced has many roots in colonialism, um, and that could be another book. Uh, I found that too much writing about placemaking, creative placemaking has been self-congratulatory, focusing only on positive outcomes, which I'm all for, and there are many. At the same time, we need to acknowledge the dark sides, the ups and the downs, and that there are many historical threads at work. The chapters in the section place the work in historical context and show that it is often fraught with conflict for reasons sometimes originating outside the work or outside the community itself. Jonathan Chrisman's story of Los Angeles, Little Tokyo, begins well over a century ago, tracing the slow building of community interrupted by mass forced dislocation during World War II and taking of lands again, and then a slow rebuilding that continues. However, that community remains tenuous because of the insatiable thirst of colonial capitalism to control property and to define almost everything as property. In the opening chapter of my section, Jiangju Shin's story of Gwangju, South Korea, bloody battles over democracy there in 1979-1980 profoundly shaped the meaning and major physical rebuilding of the center of that city. The section of the book also makes the point that conflicts can be large and they can be small. They can include violence or in some cases where symbolism is weaponized in ways that deeply affect lives. In what I hate to call a coincidence, my deadline for writing the introductory essay for the section was June 1st of last year. I started the essay the very day that I was awoken at 3.30 in the morning to watch out our window right, right here, as much of our South Minneapolis neighborhood burned in the days after the murder of George Floyd, just a few blocks from here. Over 100 businesses, nonprofit organizations, two post offices, a library burned to the ground. Decades of slow building of a diverse community of residents and small businesses felt unbuilt in a short and violent manner. Our progressive activist neighborhood was shattered in a matter of days and a couple nights of fires. I was still shaking while writing that essay, but it made personal how communities can be built, destroyed and rebuilt, how conflicts can surface, sometimes for reasons outside our control, but that we still have to cope with. While everybody in this community was shaken by these events, events that horribly continue, the feeling of community, the connections among neighbors were not shaken. 
for most, they're stronger than before. This is the real work of placemakers, building relationships, a shared sense of connections of place. Conflicts will happen. How we work through them is what matters. Places are where we find ourselves. Compassion, composure, and commitment to community are what we can make. With that, I look forward to listening for the rest of the session. Um, and I will turn the microphone, as it were, to Roberto. Let me unmute myself. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, uh, Tom and Cara, to inviting me to uh, be part of this conversation and my role as a as you characterize it, an interloper. And this morning I was sort of preparing and I really, before I go down my, I have a little joke that you can fill in in the chat later, but I was just wanted to share with you that I read both David Jonathan's and Francis's article. They're super rich. There's a lot of information in them and hopefully they'll do the right kind of uh, to share with you some of the richness of it. So I, it says that um, that I am the interloper and the, these three individuals are the provocateurs. So immediately I said, okay, there's a joke there. An interloper and three wa provocateurs walk into a bar. So dot, dot, dot. You can type your response in the chat. Let's see what we get at the end of our conversation. But there's something sweet about uh, being a provocateur. I am often considered that, and I'm also considered to be an inter interloper. Um, and so I, I appreciate that. Uh, I just, when we chatted previously, I asked all the authors to think about some keywords that are in their various, their essays, and to use that as a prompt for them to sort of describe a little bit their works. Uh, Jonathan's essay is called uh, From the Dust of Bad Stars. Uh, Francis is Embedded Artist Project. And David is Free State Boulevard. Um, they're, they're wonderful. So I'm just going to immediately go down this path. And Jonathan, uh, we'll start off with you. All right, thank you, Roberto. Um, and if I'm, I'm if I'm not mistaken on our format, I think Roberto is going to, um, yeah, interject and be an interlocutor and interrupter and provocateur throughout. So, um, yeah, please, please don't hesitate to uh, make this a little bit more conversational. Um, and thank you to to Tom for the introduction and to Cara for putting this together and to both of you for for editing this wonderful volume. Uh, it's really exciting to be a piece of this volume because I think, like Tom was suggesting, it really does take an expanded look uh, at placemaking beyond the kind of self-congratulatory uh, sort of notion of kind of institution or top-down enabled creative placemaking. And I think really does place the term in, in a kind of expanded field um, that includes uh, something that, uh, I, I don't know, I didn't actually really name it in the piece, but maybe we could call it grassroots placemaking. I think the reality, you know, when we think about placemaking, there is this sort of trend over the past, you know, 15 years of uh, a kind of foundation funded and enabled creative placemaking. Like Tom mentioned, many, many of the projects have really uh, extraordinary outcomes, but there are a lot of problematics associated with those practices as well. Um, and I think one, one kind of uh, sort of complexity that, that often goes uh, sort of ignored is the fact that, you know, Placemaking didn't uh, wasn't invented 15 years ago. I mean, people have been uh, making places in their in their communities uh, uh, basically since you know uh, as long as we've been human. And so uh, the the piece that I wrote um, in in the volume from the dust of bad stars uh, really looks at the century long history of placemaking, grassroots placemaking, community placemaking emanating out of the neighborhood of Little Tokyo in Los Angeles. And uh, this is a historic Japanese American neighborhood. Um, uh, you know, some note its origin point um, with the 
uh, immigration of a, a Japanese American sailor and chef uh, named uh, uh, Charlie, who <laughs> goes by the name Charlie, who opened a restaurant, Kame restaurant um, in the uh, 1880s um, in uh, what was then a dusty little outpost called Los Angeles. Um, and you know, since grew uh, to a community of about 30,000 Japanese Americans um, you know, in this, in this uh, area in downtown Los Angeles prior to the uh, a really violent upheaval, complete dislocation of the entire community um, as Japanese Americans in the United States were forcibly uh, uh, removed and relocated into what were effectively concentration camps during World War II because of anti-Asian uh, animus. Um, so, you know, the piece is called From the Dust of Bad Stars because for a few reasons. It's a, it's a little bit of a, a kind of poetics that I'm trying to, uh, to perform, connecting uh, uh, the sort of etymology of disaster uh, found in bad stars as a, a real driving force that shapes places, communities, and experiences for us as humans. Um, I think the sort of contingency and disaster that befall us are often moments where uh, uh, we actually, you know, respond uh, collectively, that we build relationships with one another and figure out how to move forward. Not that these moments uh, should necessarily be celebrated um, because they are moments of collective trauma, but at the same time, I think they are really important moments to consider when we think about placemaking. Um, I think another, another uh, idea that I try to get at in the piece is the idea, I, I think increasingly we're seeing um, folks kind of analyze and discuss what we call disasters um, as anything but the sort of random chance happenings that historically we've understood disasters to be natural disasters and so forth. But actually uh, in contemporary society, uh, given uh, the nature of sort of global capital, uh, of state uh, apparatus, uh, apparatuses, uh, et cetera, that what we call disasters today um, are actually largely human engineered occurrences. Um, that when the levees broke, um, you know, in, in New, Orle or New Orleans, um, that that was actually uh, the result of decades of intentional uh, sort of policy making and uh, funding in that area. Um, you know, and, and I think the same could be uh, said for Little Tokyo that, you know, what we might call a disaster is, 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 nothing, um, uh, is, is nothing close to a, a sort of random chance occurrence, um, but actually are a set of, um, of uh, in, uh, actions uh, that the community then needs to uh, respond to or perish. Um, and I think we've seen that with, with many communities um, especially ethnic and immigrant communities who uh, don't have uh, sort of relative uh, a power in, in comparison to municipal govern, uh, governments, uh, uh, you know, wealthier, often whiter communities, um, et cetera, that in, in the face of such disaster, um, communities are often sort of wiped off the map. And I think something that's really extraordinary uh, and special about Little Tokyo um, is that it has proven time and time again to take these uh, uh, extraordinary challenges and respond in kind, and that the community has sustained through today, despite uh, internment, despite uh, redlining, uh, removal through eminent domain, um, you know, racist housing and mortgage lending practices. Um, it's in, and of course, you know, today I think the the buzzword on everyone's uh, uh, lips, you know, which the word was once a, an academic term and now it's like you can walk down the street and everybody's talking about it, which is of course gentrification. Um, and so uh, the idea of examining what emerges from the dust of bad stars, I think really has to uh, you know, contend with this idea of disaster. But the other piece of that title um, is dust. And uh, I think the, the other really important kind of underlying sort of uh, structural element that um, Little Tokyo has historically really taken into account in, I think, a fairly sophisticated way is the often invisible but uh, super important nature of property rights. This, this of course, is something that is co-constructed. This is not uh, a sort of, you know, 
natural phenomenon that you can analyze through a field like physics. Rather, um, it is something that's co-constructed uh, through uh, practices, through laws, through cultural agreements. Um, and uh, they have since become sort of naturalized and normalized uh, so that it be they become like air or uh, you know, something that is all around us that we need to survive. Um, and, um, um, but that we, we, you know, it's invisible until it's taken away. Um, and uh, I think one thing that Little Tokyo historically has done um, is uh, pay a special attention to the importance of property rights and make a series of concerted collective responses to some of these disasters um, to, to stake a claim over the future of their community um, by actually uh, a, a, a kind of um, strategic intervention into the realm of property rights. Um, so historically uh, in the 1990s, uh, when property values were very low, um, there was a concerted effort, um, not entirely because of low property values. I think that that was sort of a, a, a kind of contingent uh, fluke of history. But, Jonathan, but during, uh, yeah. Jonathan, let me yeah. enter interleave here and I want to make sure we go around the circle. Uh, sure. But one, two things. These are more comments before we go to Francis. Uh, but I love the article. I mean, I love your, uh, in my thinking, always part of the problem with creative placemaking as a field that started to sort of unfold. It never made the distinction of whether it was a property rights movement or a human rights movement. As people of color in America, we're still seen as property. And the little studio, little that can, you know, and so it's which through gentrification, you have no property rights. And so that there's that there's that wonderful story embedded in in your essay about um, the community coming together and sort of dealing with that mindset. But the other sort of thing on top of this, we're at this moment of what I call civic trauma that COVID-19 has disrupted all social networks. And often the discourse around trauma is doesn't, kind of doesn't open up and talk about civicness. And in a way, creative placemaking can be characterized as a civic trauma. And one last thing, I love bad stars. I love poetics. I love metaphor. So what a perfect segue to Francis, who, who is really, uh, talked uh, extensively about um, <clears throat> her work with artists and 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 in that arena. Uh, we'll come back together. I'm just doing a little like responding hmm. and then kick the ball around and then we'll open it hmm. up. So Francis. Okay, uh, I'm gonna try to share my screen. Um, can everybody see that? <clears throat> okay, so I'm gonna tell you a very quick story um, because this is related to what I wrote about in the um, uh, in my essay, I am in a different part. I think Kara can address that. I think it's on artist practices. But in any case, uh, years ago, I started. I came up with this idea of the embedded artist to uh, place artists in. Everybody's doing this now, but it, you know, this was like in 2006. Place artists in civic settings, and uh, you know, the um, the short version is to uh, not just expand possibilities and imagination and be, bring out creativity and all that good stuff that we know we can do, but actually take care of signification and meaning and be sure that it was interjected into other projects that might be dominated otherwise by engineering or something else to explore what I love the term, the expressive potential of public infrastructure. So this was where I began and um, the, I worked in many cities, but principally in Chicago. And one of the ones I can talk about very quickly was the 606. So the 6 I was the lead artist for the 606. It's a three mile rails to trails project and has, it's really a soup to nuts kind of program. They did is creative placemaking, but there's also a lot of contention around top down, bottom up. And when I got done with this project, oh, by the way, the, the most significant thing that we did in my opinion was planted uh, 453 apple service berries, which will in the spring create a stunning, when they're mature, uh, climate sensitive 
uh, beauty installation that then is ephemeral and vanishes. It's based on the Japanese Cherry Blossom Festival. It also provides citizen science observation program opportunities along the trail. And that all has to do with climate change and Lake Michigan. But it was very, very top down. And when I got done with that project, I was really longing to work in a more intimate setting. So I went around the bottom of the lake to, you know, Gary, Indiana is part of the metropolitan area, but it's a world apart. And there, uh, here's, you can see the bottom of the lake. So to the left is Chicago, for those of you not in Chicago who don't know the area. And to the right, as you go around the bottom of Lake Michigan, you end up in Gary, Indiana, which was dominated by the, by the U.S. steel mill that was there. And it's, it's uh, probably among the most depressed uh, legacy post-industrial cities has experienced massive depopulation. It makes, um, it makes Detroit look like a plush suburb. I mean, it's really decimated. And there's a lot of contention about what the future of Gary should be. But what I knew, because I pay a lot of attention to land, is that underneath the land at the bottom of the lake, unlike Chicago, is a sand deposit, an ancient 4,000 year, 14,000 year old sand deposit. And this changes the nature of the place if we want to actually listen to the place. And I'm going to come back to the idea of what is the place telling us it already is, not the anthropocentric idea of what do we want it to be. But Gary, this is just an example of the neighborhood I ended up working in. The green is what they would call vacant, but we might call available land, land that is rewilding because uh, humans have left. And there I joined, uh, I love Geertz's idea of deep hanging out. I was not a native of Gary, I, I was a blow in. I came over and I joined efforts that were already underway. I, it would be inappropriate and arrogant of me to come and say what Gary should be. So I joined some neighborhood efforts in a co-creative way. <clears throat> and over a period of five years, we began to look at the question of fruit growing we evolved a prototype called the seven year lot, which begins to use the idea of time. And this is one idea I'd like to put on the table. How do, how do we think of place durationally, space and time linked together and not separate the spatial and the temporal? So I think this is very important, at least for the work that I do. So here's a, one of the community prototype seven year lots. And this was all driven not just by uh, food justice and urban agriculture and a uh, new fruit economy, which are very important, but also by the notion of beauty, because all of these flowering plants are stunningly beautiful in the spring. And this brings us, so we were, I had people who joined the initiative primarily because they were interested in flowering trees for, for Gary, because Gary is a pretty unbeautiful place. So the art world gave up on beauty a while ago because of its association with power. I like to say maybe we're back in the beauty business or maybe we should be. So uh, being very literal about our three words, here you can see, I just want to comment that the, the fruit growing is not just about the pleasure of eating the fruit and the pleasure of watching something unfold tree growing over a lifetime, but also about visual beauty. And so it very much appeals to the notion of affect. Antagonism is at the core of this project because the city of Gary, the government keeps wanting to do what they call redevelopment, but there is no population who wants to come to Gary. So who are these people that are gonna redevelop it? So I say what we need to do is undevelopment. And that word puts them, makes them apoplectic because they're still in the progress myth. But we need to rewild Gary or ask what the land can be and not just this canned idea of redevelopment. So I'm very antagonistic in my, pre in my premise. And the last thing about attachment, I go back to deep hanging out. You know, people are mobile and increasingly so. And with climate change and look at all the global unsettlement and migration that's happened in the last 10 years. So this idea of place, we need mechanisms to incorporate and reattach people who are new to a place. We can't just say, I've always been here, therefore I'm the only legitimate user of this place or inhabitant or visionary or imaginary because people are increasingly unsettled and moving about. And so how can we begin to think about attachment um, temporally? We're back to the question of time. So in this way, I'd like to put three terms on the table. The first is from Vanessa Watts, 
who is a Handison Mohawk and Ashtanabi scholar and their belief about place as she puts it, she writes about it beautifully, it's in my article, is that unlike the European uh, Cartesian idea of I think therefore I am, uh, this nation's uh, native uh, First Nations idea is the place thinks, therefore I can think. Like the place has thought and all thought emanates from place. So what about this interesting idea about place thought? Can we listen to places about what they want to be and not what is imposed? And how, 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 what does that look like? How can we work in long time so that we are creating uh, and contributing to, to places that are sustainable durationally and are not just quick fix gentrification, quick money in and out kind of approaches, purely economic and purely short term. And last, I would like to put the term revelatory. How can we reveal the nature of the place, what the place wants to be so that we are integrative with the places we make and are not fighting the systems that will eventually pull something apart and make it temporary. And the idea of artists making the invisible visible is right in line with this. So how can we work to, uh, to reveal, or as Jerry Wilhelm says, reconnect to the realities of place in a ge uh, geographic, biologic, and cultural way, but through, through time and uh, in not just through the Euro-colonial lens. Thank you. Uh, very good, thank you. Just a couple quick responses uh, before we go to David. I, I love this. Uh, there is um, a couple of things come, came to mind. Uh, when you talk about beauty, there's often um, beauty, there's a conversation about beauty as an articulation of the plural and not the object and in the relation to uh, where you stand, where you, what you know, your relation to your neighbor. So that's a kind of expanded frame of beauty beyond the object, which I think is really helpful in uh, engagement projects when we, people say, where's the beauty? Well, the beauty is like in the handshake uh, to a certain extent. I love this notion of stewardship that's embedded in all of your, 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 your work. Um, and then coming from the Southwest and some indigenous um, planners and that are in the book. There's a complementary term to play to place thought is place knowing. So if you know the land that you're on and you know it has thought, then you're 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 doing a good job of being a steward and mindful of that those those dynamics. Uh, so just some thoughts. And Dave, uh, what I welcome. This is a cat that knows about place in, <laughs> in a very localized uh, neighborhood uh, in Lawrence, uh, at Kansas. Uh, his piece is called um, Free Street Boulevard. And um, I'll let you just talk about it, and then I'll riff a little bit, then open it up for conversation among all of us. Thank ahead, you, Roberto. Yeah, thank you, Roberto. Um, it's great to be here today. Thank you, Cara and Tom, Jonathan and Francis, uh, inspiring all of you. Um, like Roberto said, I'm coming from East Lawrence, which is right on the Kansas River. Um, folks around here tend to forget uh, why the state is named Kansas and why the river is the Ka but this was the land of the Kanza people, still is for many. Um, and sometimes that memory is overtaken by this mythology of Kansas becoming a quote unquote free state with our uh, pre-Civil War history out here. Uh, we like to take wild pride actually in having hosted John Brown and others to ensure that the state would be free to some people, of course. So I've been here 30 years, lived in this neighborhood. Uh, I work here, I'm raising my son here. And in 2012, uh, we were offered sort of out of the blue, a wild opportunity that came through this organization called Art Place 
It was a half million dollar grant. It was gonna be administered by our local arts center to remake and revitalize the main street through our neighborhood. I say it was a surprise because myself, my neighbors, folks on our neighborhood board had no idea that this project was in the works, which I guess was the first red flag. And what it led to was us getting together as we do in times of celebration, but also in times of concern and question to find out what the heck was going on with this project and, and what, uh, what was in this proposal to revitalize us. Well, lo and behold, it was named Free State Boulevard. So they were taking this uh, history of the pre-Civil War days and really trading on it uh, in order to push this uh, placemaking project across. And that was really another red flag for us because uh, we've seen this kind of thing happen in our community and in the area for a long time where where that kind of mythology is put forward to, to claim a certain kind of moral high ground. And so initially we were advocating for a place at the table, right? A seat at the table for some, uh, some way to exert some of our influence on what this project was gonna be. We quickly discovered that uh, we weren't needed <laughs> there. <laughs> at least as far as the organizers were concerned, we weren't needed. And so our role really shifted to, uh, to opposition and to finding out uh, how we could strategically uh, work ourselves into this project to shift it in one way or another. And that led to many things. It led to organizing art projects on the street. It led to a freedom of information uh, requests to get emails. It led to uh, uh, political action in our local city council to get candidates elected that might shift uh, the conversation. Um, what ended up happening is that the project had such momentum that in spite of our efforts, it was sort of a done deal in the city. And we were told time and time again hey, this is inevitable, you know, good or bad, neighborhoods are changing, call it gentrification if you want. That's not necessarily a bad thing, we heard. Gentrification could be a good thing. And I heard personally, Dave, listen, you're either on the bus or you're under the bus, what's it gonna be? And this is one of the words I wanted to put forward, inevitability, because I don't buy it. I don't buy that notion of inevitability when it comes to this kind of displacement and to other human rights as Roberto mentioned. So we fought back and we didn't have the votes, but then, you know, the world's a crazy place and you can be surprised. And in our city commission election, the two candidates we wanted won and the mayor of the city was arrested for embezzlement. So all of a sudden we had a flipped city council and we had the votes and the project died. The project died, it was tabled forever. So what seemed like it was inevitable was not, but that's not the end of the story. And this is the last thing I'll add is that, you know, the project had been tabled. There were lots of, there was still lots of tension, animosity and anger in the neighborhood. And after a while, myself and a few other folks here got together and thought, you know, what if, what if we had the opportunity to imagine a project of this scale in our neighborhood, what would we do? You know, understanding the circumstances as they are. And so we got together and <laughs> dipped our toe into this cauldron uh, of animosity and anger and suggested so boldly that maybe we are reimagine this project in a new way. And so we found some partners who had previously been enemies, organized and created what we called uh, uh, rebuilding East 9th Street together. And we used the remaining funds from this massive art place project to do something that was 
much more equ equitable and just involved youth from the community. We had what we called neighborhood specialists. We held up and honored the things that were already in the neighborhood and did the best we could, I guess is what I, what I should say. That's not to say that we healed all the wounds because we didn't. And it's, <laughs> I still have to look over my shoulder every now and then, but it was an incredible journey. And mine is sort of a first person account of what placemaking can look like in, in Kansas. Thank you, David. I think it's also an account of agency, how agency is achieved in this placemaking world of, of with many different stakeholders. And I think the uh, kind of the beauty of your story is uh, a story of governance and not government and how people often think that government is the, is how we order our lives, but there's governance and, and as your community asserted its agency, uh, a form of governance related to place and place making and place knowing and place thought and place keeping, all of these things sort of came, came, came to be. Um, I think I'll, I'll ask one question to both of you, uh, all three of you, excuse me, and uh, and then it'll open it up. But but before I ask this question, maybe let me back up. Do you guys have questions for each other? You don't have to make one up. Let me ask my question. We'll come back. To uh, I think that one of the things that um, in all of these stories, there's another story about uh, the politics of resources and position uh, and how they work, uh, <clears throat> whether it's uh, a philanthropic resources and you have no agency or whether it's municipal uh, resources and how they work or community development corporation and those resources. So those, those things, let's talk dirty for the moment, moment and talk about money. <laughs> how did, what was, I mean, Francis, who paid you those artists? Uh, and did it come out of the city? Did it come from private foundation? And Jonathan, we, you could, let's, ha let's have some money stories. Mm. Well, I was gonna um, just mention about what, I mean, that's really two different things. The embedded artist, there were many different ways that artists were paid. Uh, it's kind of complicated to get into. But with Gary, I just wanted to say that, so I, was, uh, I had a small grant from a Blade of Grass Foundation. It was really a fellowship, but I treated it like a grant. I didn't take a penny. I spent the whole thing on establishing an organization and using it for the project. There was a, uh, a very high dollar art place uh, project also going on in Gary that was connected to food, but it didn't connect to any of the grassroots um, community development initiatives that were going on that I attached myself to. And it was very odd. It was just exactly like uh, Dave. It was different money and it was different universes. And it was like, um, you know, it just felt like high art, low art, uh, big money, low, little money. I'll just say we got a lot more bang for our buck. Uh, that's all I can say. <laughs> very good, thank you. I could, I could jump in and just respond. I think. I apologize because I think when I when I was sort of um, going off about Little Tokyo's history, I, I I only got to kind of get as far as talking about the bad things that happened, <laughs> and and I just want to emphasize, you know, the story of Little Tokyo isn't just those bad things, um, those disasters, but it's really a story of how the community came together and responded to them. So what I was gonna say earlier is that there was this moment in the 90s where there was a concerted effort by the community to re-centralize all of the local community institutions in Little Tokyo and actually take that land out of the speculative real estate market and put it toward community use. Um, so that included uh, temples, churches, uh, cultural institutions. And I think that, that um, moment in history has actually sort of buffered some of the worst pressures of gentrification even today, um, though they still exist. And uh, the other 
response, or the other kind of piece of the story that I would say in response to your question, Roberto, um, in, in terms of resources. So, you know, I think that there are a number of different ways to access power. Um, typically, we think about, you know, money and kind of, um, you know, uh, access to the upper echelons of, of political in and institutional power um, as the kind of most clear demonstrations of, of, you know, where you can kind of access those resources. Um, but I think the other locus of power um, that has long been uh, a sort of device has long been utilized by community organizers and activists on the ground, of course, is people power. It, it, you know, if you get enough people together demanding the same thing um, or, you know, threatening to vote a certain way or protest a certain way, um, you can actually um, affect change, uh, you know, uh, uh, exert your will on municipal policy, et cetera. And so today what's happening in Little Tokyo is again, I think there's a very sort of nuanced understanding of, of property rights and of this idea of sort of grassroots activism and, and um, sort of political power generation um, to stake a claim over the future of Little Tokyo through the identification that there are these three really large parcels of city owned land in Little Tokyo. And so there was, uh, there was the insight that, hey, we as a community can actually come together, we can organize we might not have all the money. We might not have, you know, access to the top echelons of, you know, political power in Los Angeles. But what we can do is, uh, you know, build a groundswell of support for us controlling the future of these huge parcels of land that are publicly owned in Little Tokyo, um, and ensure that they get built as uh, uh, and developed as sites that include affordable housing, that include resources for the community, et cetera, rather than just sort of going to the, the quote unquote, you know, sort of most and best, you know, return on investment. Um, and so I think that that's another really important lens through which we can understand resources and power is actually uh, sort of people power through community organizing. Very good, uh, Dave, and then we'll go to the Q&A and- uh, Yeah, you have so questions Jonathan, I'm, about yeah, I'm, I'm really compelled by that. <laughs> You know, we didn't have the opportunity to uh, to access or to acquire any land at all here in East Lawrence. Um, one thing to Roberto's question about money is for us, it was seduction, the seduction of a half million dollar grant. We had never seen that kind of money for art or really anything else in the neighborhood ever. So, you know, many folks in the neighborhood thought, how can we not take this? And from City Hall down, we heard you know, you'd be fools to turn away from a half million dollars. And that was a real difficult challenge for us to surmount. You know, how can you, how can you say no to those kinds of resources? I wanted to um, put another thing out there though. Um, Jonathan, you've been talking about, you know, a kind of man-made disaster. And Roberto, you mentioned earlier, placemaking as a potentially a type of trauma. And, it, those two things together remind me, it sort of triggers me back to when our project started because it felt like a disaster, you know, for us. But the thing that we realized, and, you know, with some help, I remember reading Rebecca Solnit's book, A uh, Paradise Built in Hell, is that it is sometimes in those moments of trauma and disaster <clears throat> where you turn towards each other and can do the most. And I think it's not always that way, obviously. But in this case, in our neighborhood, uh, we rose to that moment, even though there was a disaster upon us. Uh, very good. I'm gonna go and read a question that's in the chat and any one of you can respond. Uh, this is a question from Michael. Uh, does meaning making an identity work play into placemaking? Does the survival of community rely on meaning through a sense of common bounds and collective bond belonging? Thoughts? I, I, I could jump in. Um, I have a, a quick thought, and I think this also kind of relates to uh, th these these words that um, Dave, you're bringing up and Roberto, you mentioned earlier about trauma and, and, and disaster. Um, that I, I actually see uh, uh, one really valuable role for, for art practice 
um, is precisely this. It's, it's shared meaning making and building kind of a shared sense of identity um, and collective belonging and kind of shared bonds that um, uh, I think if we shift our kind of aesthetic register of what we understand as art from, um, you know, kind of historically, uh, at least in the last century, you know, we kind of understand often the art world as producing kind of a, a solo authored uh, art object oriented practices, you know, individual studios, mm -hmm. heroic artists working in, 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 you know, studios to present work in white wall galleries. If we shift away from that uh, toward uh, something perhaps more similar to the kind of work that Francis is showing, um, one that is, uh, that emerges out of a shared practice of collective interaction, um, of experience, of process, that those kinds of art practices are actually super valuable um, for uh, uh, pulling people in and generating a shared sense of identity. And I, I certainly see uh, uh, that happening in, in Little Tokyo as well, um, that the community has uh, uh, intentionally and wholeheartedly embraced um, art, not as a means for redevelopment or increasing property values, but precisely as a mechanism to fight against gentrification, which is a kind of a twist on its typical understanding, um, you know, in today's day and age, um, that they actually identified the value of art uh, in large part because of its long, its long history in Little Tokyo as a means for building community, for building solidarity and for fighting against something like gentrification. Mm -hmm. I think Jonathan, and then I'll go to Francis because I have a question for you specifically, Francis. Uh, Actually, forget about me, Francis. You have your hands raised, please. Well, <clears throat> I was just going to connect the dots of the last two questions that were asked. One is about funding, and the other is uh, about authorship. And uh, in my piece, I mentioned a, a writer, Isabel Stengers, who talks about moving to out of the binary of either or to the to the and and, and that art can do this. So, in a way, the contested definition of what constitutes art is one of the things that actually limits our ability to access other streams of funding and also limits um, uh, claims about what can be art because of authorship, either individual or shared. And so for example, one of the ways Embedded Artist has been funded is if you are willing to say that art can be art and something else at the same time, can it be art and community development? Can it be art and phytoremediation? Can it be art and, um, you know, something else, then you actually can tap into multiple funding streams and find partners of recept with receptivity in different non-art sectors. If you are also willing to say that something can function multivalently at the same time. So it is the, it's the sort of modern idea that art has to be only art. And as soon as it looks like anything else, also it ceases to be art. And this of course is a very old modernist model that persists because it's very useful to capitalism. So I think that the money and the and definition of art are deeply linked. Uh, here's, okay, Dave, and then I'll read a question. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, Francis, that's so true. Um, so I'm thinking about the question that Roberto posed, and I have a quick story about our project. When the artist team that was hired to work on this big project first met with our neighborhood, they came with a model of the neighborhood, a 3D model. And I could show you a picture, but it looked like it was a neighborhood of sugar cubes, all white, no color, no trees, no people, no yards. This was their vision of what they were starting with. They didn't see any meaning there at all. That's what they wanted to start with. And what we offered was stories. We offered our front yards, our backyards, our barbecues, our Sunday afternoons, um, our fight against the floods, all these things that made us who we were we were creative about, but also were what gave us a sense of belonging had been stripped from their process as they began. Uh, I have a question here from um, uh, Keith Lee. In ethnic and racial populations, artists have been at the forefront of creating spaces, but are often outside political processes um, let me wait, excuse me. Uh, what do policies makers need to understand about? Uh, 
artists and creative people, especially, especially in black and brown communities. So policymakers, what- I feel like the, the best, the person who could probably answer this question best is you, Roberto. <laughs> yeah, because I'm a public <laughs> policy man. Don't even open the door on this one. I, I got a text while we were talking. There, I'm at home, but I would have gone into my uh, office at City Hall and today's budget hearing day and all my artists are out there. Give me more money. And so, <laughs> but anyway, uh, I think as a policymaker, uh, and especially um, to the question of a race, uh, a couple of things come to mind. When I think about cultural policy, I'm very mindful that culture is fluid and policy aims to fix. So you have these two dynamics. So you need to have cultural policies that are very porous because artists and culture will mutate and move forward. In terms of racial equity, uh, it's very, very complicated. And going back to the civic trauma metaphor that I love at this moment after George Floyd and looking at this hyphen conversation about um, racial reckonings, uh, we are, we, we need to um, kind of think about that deeply. And for me, one of the strategies is how do my work decenter whiteness as the as the end all and be all things? I'm not so. For example, the white spatial imaginary that you're talking about, Dave, and your example, kind of is the norm. No, 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 no. If you're in a Latino neighborhood, it's going to be brightly colored build, buildings, and you know, everything's on the sidewalk and in the front yard. You know, from the parrot to um, to the, to the dog, to the swing, it's all there. So um, that's kind of, that's, that's, that's what Fruitvale is, my Latino neighborhood. Anyway, let's see, any, any questions, guys? I, could I, I, I have one little thought to add to that as well, which this was a, a, um, a little micro story that I, I wanted to insert somewhere. I, it kind of ties in with these uh, keywords that you're mentioning of, of, of civic trauma um, and kind of uh, resistance and reactions to that in particular over the past year, you know, with, with the pandemic, which I think has been an extraordinary moment of collective trauma, um, both obviously directly from uh, the sort of health implications of the pandemic, but also at an urban level um, because of the, the um, you know, the, the, the continued, especially, you know, in, in, here in um, in California and in Western United States, it's like uh, more and more people have, have become unhomed. Uh, you know, uh, uh, the cost of living has just uh, uh, gone up exponentially, even as people are losing their jobs. So it's just, I think, a really um, critical juncture and moment of collective trauma. And I just wanted to, um, let's see, share this one photo, which I think is, is, uh, gets at some of these things we're talking about. Um, let's see. So this image um, is in Little Tokyo uh, pretty recently. You can tell because everybody has their mask on. And this is a, a kind of new uh, a, a community organization that bubbled up in Little Tokyo, again, going into the same idea of sort of grassroots placemaking and, and where art fits in. Uh, they call themselves we, uh, or J-Town Action and Solidarity. And they describe themselves explicitly as culture workers dedicated to exploring, critiquing, and acting on the intersection of art, politics, and community care. And so I think this, this is kind of a demonstration of how people are reimagining placemaking and art practice in this moment of collective trauma. That again, you know, trauma, you know, it's never something to be celebrated, but it can be a moment of sort of reawakening and renewal. Um, if a community uh, has the kind of social capital um, and culture to, to, to um, respond. And I think, you know, a, a few things that are interesting with, with this organization is that they, they've been sort of active in responding to concerns around gentrification, um, but they've also been very vocal and concerned about increasing um, people without homes in Los Angeles. And the typical conversation is like, oh, you know, get these people off the streets. I don't want to see them, get them out of my sight. 
their, you know, their, the, the uh, J-Town Action and Solidarity, their response is like, no, these are our neighbors. We need to support them. We need to provide for them. Um, they've done water drops. They've provided resources. They've provided places to recharge phones um, and also advocated on a policy level um, on how to best meet these, um, this community's needs. And the other thing I'll point out as well is that you know, this isn't a historic Japanese American neighborhood. There is a, a Japanese American identity in the community, but this group is reflective of the community today, which is extremely uh, multiracial, multi-ethnic. Um, and that, that is a source of strength um, that provides a, a, a better awareness and understanding of some of these issues that communities are facing today. So I'll, I'll just stop there if I could figure out I how to stop sharing here, my screen. Uh, I think one, whether I got, we're coming to up to the hour. Uh, okay. Uh, we're coming up to the hour. We need to sort of wrap this up. I have one comment and then we'll, that maybe you can guys can spin about as part of your wrap up. Uh, and it kind of, what I heard throughout all of your uh, commentary was this notion of stewardship and how, where they're being good stewards of the land, good stewards of community relationships, good stewards around, uh, uh, identities that are closely tied to a, a locale like Japantown. Uh, some are advanced stewardship in the most ecological sense about like how do we think of land and Dave stewardship in terms of uh, neighborhood vibes. So maybe some closing remarks and if you want to spin out on stewardship, please do. Hmm. Well, well, stewardship questions the, the, the role of the human on the planet. <laughs> and I think that that's a really important question for everyone to be asking from my position, but it's a really interesting question for artists because um, this, this question of, you know, well, I have to separate art and artists half the time or I can't think because I get stuck in the art box. So I go over to the artist box because it's more permeable. But this idea of what is the social role of the artist and, uh, you know, then, you, then you're in a position to ask some other things like sustain what, what will be sustained and who will decide. And now we're into the position of asking, given our unsustainable and you know all kinds of varied conditions on the ground what should happen in the future and even with identity what do we what do we keep what do we set aside with our practices with uh our settlement patterns every, everything you know how do we begin to do that and so i think that um uh the, the, the role, the question of the artist's role in society, what it can be. A lot of people talk about artistic leadership, which is a word that kind of creeps me out, I'll tell you, but I actually think it's on the table. So I'll just leave it with that. Very good. Dave, please. Yeah, so stewardship, <laughs> I think, is something, I don't know if we use that word in, in the neighborhood, um, uh, taking care of each other, taking care of our place. And with this project, did for us, it's nothing new. I mean, we've done this before. We fought against uh, four lane highways going through the neighborhood two times. You know, the neighborhood's right adjacent to downtown, so everybody's creeping on it. But what happened in this placemaking project is that we again recognized we can have some power, yeah. And it can be at times joyful to do it, even, even when we're losing. And it reminded <laughs> us, it reminded us of what neighborhood and community meant to us. And I'm not saying every single soul in the neighborhood, but for those of us who, who were engaged. And that was a powerful thing, a beautiful thing, and something we will not forget. It will be part of the memory of this place for a long time. Jonathan, and then I'll have one last comment. Um, well, maybe I'll just one. I'll, I'll just share one more tiny little story of, of something that's happening today in Little Tokyo that, that gets at this idea of stewardship and 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 again property rights and land, um, which is 
you know, I think there's a, a very clear awareness that whoever owns the land <laughs> controls the future uh, of a place, um, at least, you know, de depending on what the property rights regime, wherever you are, is, you know, it's certainly true in Los Angeles. So um, there's been an effort to set up what they're calling a community investment fund, um, where uh, uh, investors, largely folks from the community or from the larger Japanese American community, or just people who are supportive, can buy a share, um, you know, relatively a small amount of money, maybe $5,000 or something like that. Um, and collectively, uh, this fund could then buy property in Little Tokyo and sustain it for community purposes in the future. And the idea is that there would be a, you know, it work like an investment fund, you would get a very modest return. You wouldn't be expecting some extraordinary sort of, you know, it's not gonna be um, uh, uh, the thing that, you know, it's not gonna be Bitcoin or whatever. Um, but the, the, the other key acknowledged purpose of this is that um, it's intentionally to sustain the community well into the future, that, that the benefit isn't just financial, but it, that there's this community benefit as well. And so I think there is a continued effort to try and understand how we can engage this society in this context that we live in, and given these constraints. And, and, and I think um, this, is, this is one way to kind of think about how to pursue, to pursue stewardship in a place like Little Tokyo. Uh, very good. Um, I, so among my colleagues, uh, what's, the, what's, the, what's, the, what's the rest of the joke? Uh, you know, you have the interloper and three, three uh, provocateurs walk into the bar. Uh, Jim says, yeah, but they're, but they're all troublemakers. There are troublemakers. It's very good. <laughs> uh, so anyway, I just want to pass the baton to uh, Tom and Kara, if you have any final words. And let me thank my colleagues here. Uh, uh, and Francis, I'll get you that citation uh, later on down the road, a little note to me. Um, uh, so I just uh, appreciate this. Uh, I encourage you all uh, to read these essays. They're really, really rich. And Tom, it's a great chapter of the book in Kara. It, that's a heavy lift, this anthology. It's huge. So thank you, guys. Thank you all so much. It's, it's, it, I've really enjoyed this conversation and, and you know, some brilliant uh, perspectives in the room and one of the things that I really wanted from the handbook is that it has the artist voice in it the community member voice in it you know across the board really and I think um, I've, I've heard that through this conversation and so thank you everybody um, for your time at my cat's now coming to say hello um, uh, it's yeah it's I really appreciate it and, and events like this I think also there's so much more that all of you say that isn't just in your chapter and, and that that's really given the richness to this conversation as well. So thank you and thank you everybody for for being with us for this this hour. Thank you. Do you have anything to add Tom? Just and may the conversations continue. Thank you all so much. Thank you everybody.